Brothers and sisters in Christ, the theme of our meeting together as Lutheran Church Canada is Stand Firm in the Faith. And I have been asked to address our convention on the topic of Martin Luther's famous stand at the Diet of Worms in April of 1521. Through this topic, we acknowledge one of the many quincentennial celebrations of Luther and the Reformation that Christians across the globe have highlighted through all sorts of events for well over a decade now, starting in the 10 years leading up to October 31st, 2017, the date celebrating the 500th anniversary of the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. In many ways, that celebration of nearly six years ago was premature. Luther's publishing and posting of his 95 Theses on Indulgences on October 31st, 1517, was indeed the beginning of Luther's emergence as a public figure. But it was not yet the beginning of a Reformation. The publication of Luther's 95 Theses was only the beginning of his personal transformation from Brother Martin, faithful Catholic friar and professor of theology, to Luther the Reformer, whose appeal to the Bible for the reform of Christianity was winning considerable support among the scholars and preachers and also the common people of Germany. But was rejected as heresy by the Pope and bishops of the Catholic Church. That personal transformation, which Luther himself interpreted as an experience of freedom gifted by God, was a spiritual journey for Brother Martin that took three full years. From November 1517 through the end of the year 1520, during which time Luther became the most popular author and probably the most famous man of his day. Through his many writings in those years, defending his teaching and proposals for the reform of Christianity in response to vigorous attacks by ordained clergymen who defended the papal church and laid charges of heresy against Brother Martin, Luther had grown more and more radical in his public advocacy for reform, or improvement, as he stated it, in the state of Christendom. That is, in the church, in society, and in the spiritual life of Christians in his day. This Luther affair, as it came to be called, had culminated already by June of 1520 in the decision of the Pope to excommunicate Luther as a heretic if he refused to recant his teachings. In the papal bull formally announcing this threat of excommunication, Luther was given 60 days to submit to the church's authority, to recant his views, and to seek forgiveness from the Pope. If he failed to do so, his books were to be burned and Luther himself should be turned over to the civil authorities for punishment as a condemned heretic. According to long-standing tradition and numerous precedents, the punishment of, for heresy was death by burning at the stake, condemnation of the heretic's followers, and burning of the heretic's books. Sixty days after he reserved notice of the papal bull on December 10, 1520, Luther responded by gathering with a group of students and colleagues at the University of Wittenberg and staging a book burning of his own. They burned various theological books and official documents of church law, including the papal document threatening Luther's excommunication. Soon after this radical iconoclastic act of defiance. Luther defended his action with a pamphlet entitled Why the Books of the Pope and His Disciples Were Burned by Dr. Martin Luther. In this pamphlet, Luther attacked the claim that the Pope alone judges Christian doctrine. Luther responded, if this claim stands, then Christ and his word are defeated. 
But if it does not stand, then the whole canon law, together with the Pope and his see, is defeated. With this defiant public act and his defense of it, Luther was standing firm in his faith in Christ and his word. In response to this brazen defiance, the Pope formally excommunicated Luther on January 3rd, 1521. The church had spoken, and the Pope's decision was final. So why did Martin Luther travel three months later to the Diet of Worms? And what was the purpose and meaning of Luther's speech at the Diet that we commemorate through our convention theme, Stand Firm in the Faith? Briefly stated, condemned by the authorities of the church, Martin Luther traveled to Worms in order to be heard by the authorities of the state, the rulers, the politicians of what was called the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation. These politicians, including Emperor Charles V, these politicians were gathered, much like we are this week, for a kind of convention. This was not a convention or synod of the church. This was an assembly, what was called a diet, of the civil authorities, the state. Although, in fact, some of the most powerful civil authorities in Germany in that day were also bishops or archbishops of the church. These civil authorities met normally annually and for a period that often continued not just for days but for weeks or months in order to conduct the business of the Holy Roman Empire, just as we are gathered to conduct the business of Lutheran Church Canada. Their convention started meeting in late January of 1521, soon after Martin Luther had been excommunicated by the church. One of their many items of business was this Luther affair. As I mentioned earlier, the long-standing tradition was that an excommunicated heretic who refused to recant should be turned over to the civil authorities for punishment, the death penalty, ritually performed through public burning. But Luther's prince, the very powerful and highly respected Duke Frederick the Wise, Elector of Saxony, was bucking the tradition. Citing a recent agreement between the estates of the empire and Emperor Charles V, Frederick negotiated for Luther to receive a hearing before civil authorities in Germany before they could apply the death penalty for heresy. Three months after his excommunication by the church, Luther was traveling to Worms in order to stand before the authorities of the state. This, however, was not a scenario of retrying Luther's case. According to church law, there was no appeal beyond the decision of the pope. Despite repeated irregularities that did indeed undermine the justice of the pope's decision to condemn Luther, that decision could not be appealed. The only question that remained was whether the state would abide by the long-standing tradition to execute the heretic. Charles V, the young man of only 21 years of age, who had been elected emperor just over a year earlier, Charles needed the support of the Roman church for the success of his reign as emperor. But he also needed the support of the princes and nobles, the estates of the empire. He needed the support of Luther's prince, Frederick the Wise. Elector Frederick was playing his political cards and he was playing them well. By negotiating a hearing for Luther at the Diet of the Empire, Frederick was, in effect, challenging the older, long-standing tradition that the Pope's decision was final. When the emperor, after months of negotiations, granted Frederick's request, he was in effect reopening the Luther case. The pope's nuncio or representative was furious and worked tirelessly to convince the emperor to withdraw from this agreement to have Luther appear at the Diet. Two months before Luther appeared in Worms, the emperor's personal chaplain and confessor, 
a Franciscan friar named Glapion, was engaged in negotiations with Duke Frederick's counselor, the Chancellor of Sax Saxony, Gregor Bruch. Glapion had expressed sympathy with Luther's ideas for reform, but he took sharp issue with Luther's radical rejection of the Catholic sacramental system that he had published in October 1520 through a Latin treatise with the inflammatory title, The Babylonian Captivity of the Church, a prelude by Dr. Martin Luther. In this treatise, Luther had re recounted for his readers how his Catholic opponents had driven him to ever more radical criticism of the papal church and its sacraments, which Luther now called tools of the Antichrist to enslave Christians rather than God's gifts of the gospel to free Christians through their promise of grace and forgiveness of sins through Jesus, the only mediator between God and man. Luther had indeed come a long way since his debating points about the sale of indulgence back in 1517. Now he had come to reject the papal church and its claim of priestly mediation for sinners through the seven sacraments under the control of Rome's priests. During his negotiations with Chancellor Le Bruch, Glapion argued that all the good Luther might have accomplished through his reform ideas would come to nothing if he refused to recant his radical views rejecting the church's priesthood and sacraments. He had negotiated these, uh, he had these negotiations proceeded fruitfully, Luther might have appeared in Worms with the expectation that he recant only his most radical views, not the whole of his reform ideas, as he had expressed them in book after book, sermon after sermon, and many short pamphlets addressed to the laity, as well as learned treatises responding to his opponents among the church's clergy. In the end, these negotiations, as well as all others, failed. In March, Luther received the emperor's official summons to appear at the Diet of the Empire with a promise of safe conduct. This promise of safe conduct meant that Luther would be protected from law, by law, from imprisonment and punishment, both for his journey to the Diet and for his journey home, even if he was condemned after his hearing. The summons bore the official seal of the emperor and was signed by Cardinal Albrecht, Archbishop of Mainz, the highest church official in all of Germany. As to the reason for Luther's appearance, the summons stated that the estates of the empire have purposed and decided to obtain information about the doctrine and books which have by, been issued by you some time ago. The emperor's summons said nothing about the pope's condemnation and excommunication of Luther. Elector Frederick's demand for a hearing of Luther on German soil had been granted. In March, Luther began preparations for the journey and for the hearing. He told his friends that if he, was appear, if he was to appear only to recant his views, he would not bother with the journey. He could recant his views just as easily in Wittenberg as in Worms before the emperor. But to go in order to confess his faith, to state his views clearly, and to request that his opponents point out clearly where his ideas were exposed as false on the basis of the word of God, this Luther viewed as a call from God, even if it meant martyrdom. As Luther stated, if I had a thousand heads, I would lose them all rather than recant. Luther started out on a long journey to Worms in early April, while in the city of Erfurt, where he had become an Augustinian friar 15 years earlier, Luther preached to a large crowd of supporters in the large church of the Augustinian convent. He preached on the subject of faith and good works, complaining that there were thousands of, preach, of priests, but very few preachers of the gospel. 
the good news that we are saved by faith in God's, by, in God's work in Christ, not through our good works, such, such as praying and fasting, going on pilgrimages and to holy places, or even going to Mass. This brief sermon epitomized Luther's faith that he had shared in so many writings the past three years. One brief quote conveys the central issue. Luther said, the philosopher, that is Aristotle, whose book on ethics was, the heart, was at the heart of understanding, uh, the understanding of virtue and the good life in those days. The philosopher says, do many good works, then you will acquire the habit of virtue, and finally you will become godly. I say to you, do not perform good works in order to become godly. But if you are all already godly through faith in Christ, then do good works, though without affectation and with faith. There you see how contrary these two points of view are. Nine days later, Luther entered the city of Worms, where, just as in Erfurt, he was greeted by crowds of supporters among the people. Now he was even accompanied by an imperial herald, leading horsemen sent by his supporters among the politicians. One observer at the time estimated that a crowd of some 2,000 supporters accompanied Luther for the last two and a half miles on his journey into Worms. The impression being made very clear was that this condemned heretic had a huge following. At the Diet, Luther would stand alone before the emperor and the estates, either to confess his faith and be condemned to death or perhaps exile, or he could recant his views, denying his faith and forsaking the movement for reforming Christianity that he had begun the previous year through his major treatises demanding reform. And so this was the moment of decision, of personal crisis. Fifteen years later, Dr. Luther would describe this crisis in comparison with the destruction of the world in the time of Noah as he was lecturing on the book of Genesis. Luther told his students at the university, if I were the only one in the entire world to adhere to the word of God, I alone would be the church and would properly judge about the rest of the, the world that it is not the church. Therefore, let the Pope, the cardinals, and the bishops either ally themselves with us or stop boasting that they are the church which cannot exist without the word of God because it is brought into existence by the word alone. Much hatred is heaped upon us when it is said that we have fallen away from the ancient church. The papists, on the contrary, boast that they have remained with the church and are willing to submit everything to the judgment of the church. But the accusation is false. If we want to confess the truth, we fell away from the word by remaining in their church. But now we have returned to the word and have ceased to be apostates from the word. For Martin Luther at the Diet of Worms, standing firm in the faith meant standing firm in his confession of the word of God in defiance of the authorities of the church who had condemned his teaching as, her as heresy, but in so doing had actually condemned the word of God. The day after his arrival in Worms to the fanfare of people and many of their civil leaders on the 17th of April, Luther was called to stand before the emperor and the estates. According to various reports, he was escorted to the Diet by way of side streets in order to avoid large crowds along the more direct route into the bishop's residence where the hearing would take place. It was not a large hall, but it was packed with officials of both church and state. The papal nuncio at the Diet, Jerome Aleander, 
who had worked so vigorously to oppose inviting Luther to appear at the Diet, and who sought to control events so as to prevent Luther from having any opportunity to debate the justice of his condemnation, Aleander wrote to Cardinal Medici, the cousin of Pope Leo, that Luther acted nervously before the imperial majesty. Moving his head hither and thither, up and down, Aleander concluded, Luther's appearance has had the most salutary consequences. For now the emperor and almost all other persons recognize that he is a foolish, immoral, crazy man. At the very first glance, the emperor said, he will never make me a heretic. Johann von der Ecken, general secretary of the Bishop of Trier, had been chosen as the spokesman for the emperor during the hearing. Everything had to be spoken, both in Latin and German, addressing both imperial and ecclesiastical officials. The emperor himself understood little Latin and no German. His mother language was the Burgundian form of French. So Luther's answers all needed to be explained to him. Secretary Eck stated, his imperial majesty has summoned you here, Martin Luther, for these two reasons. First, that you may here publicly acknowledge if the books published so far under your name are yours. Then, whether you wish all these to be regarded as your work, or whether you wish to retract anything in them. Luther's lawyer, Dr. Jerome Scherf, cried out in a loud voice, let the titles of the books be read. Luther's ecclesiastical opponents, probably through the leadership of the nuncio, Aleander, had made sure there were plenty of Luther's books present in the room, laid out on a table in front of Luther and the emperor. Titles or brief descriptions of pamphlets were read aloud of Luther's writings both in German and in Latin. A list of the assembled books in the records of the Diet includes 22 of Luther's writings there on the table. Luther acknowledged that they were all his and stated, I shall never deny any of them. But the second question, whether he would recant what he had written, was more difficult. As for the next question, Luther answered, whether I would likewise affirm everything or retract what is supposed to have been uttered beyond the testimony of scripture, because this is a question of faith and the salvation of souls, and because it concerns the divine word, which we are all bound to reverence, for there is nothing greater in heaven or on earth, it would be rash and at the same time dangerous for me to put forth anything without proper consideration, since without previous de deliberation I could assert less than the cause demands or more than accords with the truth. I might, in either case, come under Christ's judgment when he said, whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. For this reason, I beseech your imperial majesty for time to think, in order to satisfactorily answer the question without violence to the divine word and danger to my own soul. A consultation followed between some of the officials with the emperor. Luther was upbraided by their spokesman, Eck, for not being prepared to give an answer immediately. The imperial and church officials were concerned to prevent Luther from any opportunity to debate openly his teachings that had already been condemned by the Pope. But the emperor was gracious. He gave Luther one day, and the next day he must be ready to answer the question whether he would recant the teachings of his books. He must reply orally and would not be permitted to read aloud a prepared written statement. Escorted back to his room, Luther received encouragement that evening from various supporters, either through personal visit or through letters delivered to him. But apparently, his bearing in the diet this first day had not impressed those in the hall. Supporters who had earlier read Luther's writings had been impressed with the boldness, the defiance, even the audacity of his written defense of his teachings and his attacks against the Pope and defenders of the Pope's authority. But Friar Luther's bearing in the hall before the emperor and the estates was much more reserved. 
Luther was not playing to the gallery, but knew he was speaking before the emperor and powerful officials of church and state. His request for time to think more fully before answering struck some as a delaying tactic. The pressure for Luther must have been immense. Preserved among the many written records of these days at the Diet is a prayer of Luther's, perhaps written down by one of his companions as Luther prayed aloud in his room. Its precise context cannot be determined, but it reveals both the stress and the fervent faith of Luther in his God in the midst of this crisis in his life. Among its many petitions, Luther prayed, O oh God, O oh my God, Thou who art my God, be with me in this conflict with the reason and wisdom of the world. I pledge thee, thou must do it, thou alone. This affair is not mine, but thine. Personally, I have no business here with these great lords of the world. But, O oh Lord, this affair is thine, and it is righteous and concerns eternity. Stand by me, thou faithful and everlasting God. The next day, Luther was escorted once again by four o'clock in the afternoon to the bishop's residence, where the proceedings were taking place, now in a larger hall and with a larger crowd present. But his hearing was delayed by the business being conducted between the emperor and the princes. So that only at six o'clock was Luther presented once again before the emperor's court for the continuation of his hearing. The imperial spokesman Eck once again addressed Luther, chiding him for being unready the previous day to give his answer and ending his reproachful address. Come then, answer the question of his majesty, whose kindness you have experienced in seeking time for thought. Do you wish to defend all your acknowledged books or to retract some? Again, all statements in the hearing were spoken in Latin and then repeated in German. Careful notes must have been taken by several parties, for there are preserved several written accounts of Luther's speech with very little difference of substance between them, and even, even when they were later published in both Latin and German versions. Luther began his answer more carefully than the previous day, acknowledging the auspicious gathering of emperor, princes, and lords before whom he stood. Most serene emperor, he began, most illustrious, most clement lords, obedient to the time set before me yesterday evening, I, be I appear before you, beseeching you by the mercy of God, that your most serene majesty and your most illustrious lordships may deign to listen graciously to this my cause, which is, as I hope, a cause of justice and truth. If through my inexperience I have either not given the proper titles to some or have offended in some manner against court customs and etiquette, I beseech you to kindly pardon me as a man accustomed not to courts, but to the cells of monks. I can bear no other witness about myself, but that I have taught and written up to this time with simplicity of heart, as I had in view only the glory of God and the sound instruction of Christ's faithful. Luther went on to acknowledge once again the books there present in the room as his books, although he could not guarantee that in the process of publication some matters might have been changed or misinterpreted by the printers. But in answer to the second question about whether he would retract what he had written, Luther replied that his books were not all of the same kind. For there are some writings in which I have discussed religious faith and morals simply and evangelically, so that even my enemies themselves are compelled to admit that they are use, useful, harmless, and clearly worthy to be read by Christians. To recant these writings would be out of the question. Another group of my books, Luther continued, attacks the papacy 
and the affairs of the papists as those who both by their doctrines and very wicked examples have laid waste the Christian world with evil that affects the spirit and the body. For no one can deny or conceal this fact when the experience of all and the complaints of everyone that through the decrees of the Pope and the doctrines of men, the consciences of the faithful have been most miserably entangled, tortured, and torn to pieces. If therefore I should have retracted these writings, I should have done nothing other than to have added strength to this tyranny, and I should have opened not only windows but doors to such godlessness. Here, Luther was aptly characterizing the substance of his increasingly vigorous criticism of the Pope and the Papal Church over the past three years, and he was refusing to back down. Luther had been condemned because he had charged the papacy and his papal opponents not just with moral and political corruption, as many had done before him for well over a century. Luther had been condemned in several... Uh, condemned because in several of his writings, especially over the past year, 1520, he had exposed the papal church and its system as tyranny and godlessness. Luther had done this not only in sharply polemical treatises, such as the Babylonian captivity of the church, and in his several responses answering the specific charges of heretical teaching in his earlier works, teachings that had been collected in the papal bull threatening his excommunication. Luther had also exposed the papal system as godless in his treatise on Christian liberty, which he had prefaced with a personal letter addressing the pope respectfully and as a Christian brother though one, Luther said, who was like a lamb in the midst of wolves. The rhetorical climax of this open letter draws irony from the customary titles of the Pope as servant of the servants of God and as vicar of Christ. Luther exposes the error of the Pope's servants who exalt his authority even over church councils and ascribe to the Pope alone the right to interpret scripture. He then had concluded in this letter to Pope Leo, in sum, believe none who exalt you, but only those who humble you. For this is the judgment of God, who has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. Look at how different Christ is from his successors, although they still all want to be his vicars. And I fear that most of them have been too literally his vicars, for a person is a vicar only in the absence of a superior. But if the Pope rules when Christ is absent and not present and dwelling in his heart, what is that but to be a vicar of Christ? And then what is the church other than a whole group of people without Christ? Truly, what is such a vicar except an antichrist and idol? How much more correctly did the apostles call themselves servant of a present Christ than vicars of an absent Christ? Now, at the Diet of Worms, several months after he had written these words to the Pope and published them as the preface to one of his most popular writings, Luther was standing before the emperor and the princes and lords of the empire. And he was standing firm in his faith that Christ Jesus is present with his church. Christ was present with Luther himself as he did not deny but rather confess this present Christ and therefore could not retract his beliefs and teachings rejecting a papal system that was persistently attacking the word of God. Luther then went on in his speech to identify a third kind of book he had written. Books against some private and, as they say, distinguished individuals, those namely who strive to preserve the Roman tyranny and to destroy the godliness taught by me. Against these I confess, I have been more violent than my religion or profession demands. 
But then I do not set myself up as a saint. Neither am I disputing about my life, but about the teaching of Christ. It is not proper for me to retract these works, because by this retraction it would, go, it would again happen that tyranny and godlessness would, with my patronage, rule and rage among the people of God more violently than ever before. So then, even while acknowledging his fault of provocation and violent language in certain of his writings, these writings addressed to churchmen, Luther stood firm in his faith and refused to compromise because the question at hand was not Luther's opinions or Luther's interpretations of the Bible or Luther's manner of responding to his opponents. The question at hand was the teaching of Christ. This is why Luther went on in his speech to compare himself to Jesus. For Jesus, too, had been questioned about his teaching by the highest religious authority of his day, the high priests of the Jews in Jerusalem. And Luther explained, when questioned before Annas about his teaching and struck by a servant, Jesus said, if I have spoken wrongly, bear witness to the wrong. If the Lord himself, who knew that he could not err, did not refuse to hear testimony against his teaching, even from the lowliest servant, how much more ought I, who am the lowest scum and able to do nothing except err, desire and expect that somebody should want to offer testimony about my teaching. And therefore I ask, by the mercy of God, bear witness, expose my errors, overthrowing them by the writings of the prophets and evangelists. Once I have been taught, I shall be quite ready to renounce every error, and I shall be the first to cast my books into the fire. Luther indeed had considered his situation carefully. He knew that his teaching, which he was refusing to retract, was causing dissension. He went on to say, to see excitement and dissension arise because of the word of God is to me clearly the most joyful aspect of all in these matters. For in this way, the opportunity and the result of the word of God, just as Christ said, this is the way, just as Christ said, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. And therefore, we ought to think, how marvelous and terrible is our God in his counsels, lest by chance what is attempted for settling strife grows rather in into an intolerable deluge of evils if we begin by condemning the word of God. These and similar words given toward the end of his speech probably sealed Luther's fate in the mind of the emperor and many of the princes. They feared nothing more than dissension and strife in Christendom, especially dissension and strife over religion. When the Pope years earlier had learned of the controversy developing in Germany over Luther's 95 Theses, he had initially dismissed it as a squabble among some German monks. Luther, standing firm in his faith at the Diet of Worms, made it clear that the controversy over the monk, Martin Luther, had become a controversy that threatened the social fabric of the Christian world because it was, in fact, a controversy over the word of God. When Luther had finished his speech, the imperial spokesman repro reproached him once again for straying from the issue at hand that Luther had called into question things which had been condemned and defined in church councils. Once again, the spokesman Eck demanded a simple answer. Would he or would he not recant? And Luther replied, Since then, your serene majesty and your lordships seek a simple answer. I will give it in this manner, neither horned nor toothed. Unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason, for I do not trust either in the Pope or in councils alone, since it is well known that they have often erred and contradicted themselves, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not retract anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience, 
I cannot do otherwise. Here I stand. May God help me. Amen. These are the words that have reached legendary status and would come to define the Protestant Reformation. This is the moment in Luther's speech that was portrayed at the time in printed woodcut images and in later generations would be remembered as the scene that displayed the essence of the Reformation. Luther standing firm in his faith, refusing to recant, defiant before the powers of the day, and determined to confess the truth of the word of God, even should it mean his condemnation to death or exile. Some historians are skeptical about the authenticity of one phrase toward the end of Luther's speech. The words, here I, I, the words, I cannot do otherwise, here I stand, do not appear in some of the transcripts recording Luther's speech. Perhaps Luther spoke them in the Latin version of his speech and did not repeat them in German, or vice versa. Perhaps he did not speak those words at all. But there can be no doubt that this is what Luther, in fact, did. He stood firm in his faith, relying solely on the help of God in this moment of crisis. These few words may have been an amplification of what Luther did, in fact, do there at the Diet of Worms, added to the earliest printed version publicizing the event and Luther's speech, prepared with Luther's input and by his closest supporters present there at the hearing. More important than debating this one phrase is understanding the substance of these closing sentences of Luther's speech. While not ambiguous in the least, these words were variously interpreted right from the start. Although this was the end, although this was the end of Luther's speech, this was not yet the end of the hearing. The imperial spokesman continued to charge Luther with denying no known truths of the Catholic faith and of holding to positions already condemned by pope and councils. At issue both in Luther's responses and his published works was that Luther had proclaimed as a condemnation of the Christian creed the decision of the Council of Constance a hundred years earlier to condemn, to condemn the Bohemian or Czech reformer Jan Hus as a heretic for teaching that the universal church is not the church of the Pope, but rather the whole community of the predestined, that is the invisible, truly universal church that exists throughout the world and will exist until Jesus comes again at the last day, according to the Lord's promise. The imperial spokesman Eck stated that Luther could not prove his statement that councils had erred in matters of doctrine. Luther responded that he could indeed prove it. This was at the back of his statement, that councils and popes had erred and contradicted one another, that the visible or institutional church could indeed stray from the word of God and had even at times condemned God's word. This is why Luther demanded that he be convinced of his errors by testimony from scripture and clear reason. Luther was not asserting, as continues to be charged by Roman Catholic apologists even today, that his own personal interpretation of scripture had more authority than the interpretations of popes and councils. Luther was demanding that his teachings be refuted by scripture and reasonable arguments based on the Bible. Luther's appeal to scripture as the highest authority became the sola scriptura, or scripture alone, principle of the Reformation. And this continues to be the principle of authority for Christian teaching, for Lutherans today as for all Protestants. As Christians of Lutheran Church Canada, we will stand firm in our faith only as we stand firm on scripture alone, confessing that the only rule and guiding principle according to which all teachings and teachers are to be evaluated and judged are the prophetic and apostolic writings of the Old and New Testaments alone. A second way Luther's concluding speech at the Diet of Worms has been misconstrued has to do with 
Luther's appeal to his conscience. Already at the Diet, Luther was charged with setting up his own conscience as his authority, thus defying the authority of the church and therefore the authority of God. According to the report by the papal nuncio Aleander, the hearing of Luther before the Diet ended with the admonition of the imperial spokesman, lay aside your conscience, Martin. You must lay it aside because it is an error and it will be safe and proper to, for you to recant. In later, history, in later centuries, in the history of Western civilization, during and after the European Enlightenment, with its appeal to human reason and individual freedom from all traditional authorities, Luther's appeal to conscience was likewise interpreted as an appeal to personal freedom and autonomy. At Worms, more importantly, and in a life-changing way, after the Diet of Worms was over, while Luther was in exile, Luther did indeed experience personal freedom from the tyranny of the papal church's rule over his conscience. But in his speech and in the discussions that followed, Luther appealed not to a free conscience, but to a bound conscience. As he stated, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. We today of Lutheran Church Canada will experience a similar freedom from the tyrannies of our age, tyranny over our religious freedom, tyranny over our freedom of conscience guided by the word of God, tyranny over our freedom to think and believe according to our faith in Christ in defiance of the manifest idolatries of our society and the political systems of our age. We will experience freedom as Luther did only as we stand firm in our faith, as Luther did, subject only to Christ Jesus, our only Lord, free in Christ as our conscience is captive to the word of God. Why was Luther's stand at the Diet of Worms important in 1521? Luther's standing firm in the faith turned his own freedom and defiance into a Reformation movement that likewise became a declaration of freedom from the papal church's tyranny over the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ who justifies sinners through faith alone in his redeeming work. The very evening after Luther's speech, the emperor prepared his own speech, which was read aloud before the diet the next day. In his speech, Emperor Charles made clear that he would stand firm in the faith of his ancestors, the faith of the Roman Church. Charles took on Luther's stand directly. It is certain, he said, that a single monk errs in his opinion, which is against what all of Christendom has held for over a thousand years to the present. Charles went on to pledge to settle this matter, I have therefore determined to use all my dominions and possessions, my friends, my body, my blood, my life, and my soul. After the impertinent reply which Luther gave yesterday in our presence, I declare that I now regret having delayed so long the proceedings against him and his false doctrines. But the determination of Luther excuse me, but the determination of Charles to proceed against Luther as a notorious heretic was thwarted at the Diet and for the next several decades by broad support of Luther's reformation among the people and in particular by powerful civil authorities who continued to protect the reformer and other preachers who followed Luther's teaching. After Luther's departure from Worms, still protected under the imperial safe conduct, Elector Frederick the Wise had arranged for Luther to be abducted and taken into hiding. At the time, it was expected that Luther would spend the rest of his life in exile under the protection of the Elector at his fortress called the Wartburg. Meanwhile, at the Diet, Frederick and other princes worked to prevent the Diet from issuing a condemnation of Luther. 
the Edict of Worms, formally condemning Luther as an outlaw and demanding that his followers and his books be eradicated from the earth, was drawn up by early May within two weeks of Luther's famous stand. But the edict was never endorsed by the estates of the empire and was issued in the name of the emperor alone after those princes and other civil authorities supporting Luther had left the diet. Frederick the Wise even secured a promise for the, from the emperor that the edict would not be proclaimed in the emperor's, in the elector's lands, where Luther was in fact being protected rather than prosecuted. In fact, for the next decade, the edict of Worms was viewed in many areas of the empire as unenforceable. Any attempt to destroy Luther or his books or his followers in the several areas of the empire supporting him would cause an insurrection among the people. Powerful knights such as Ulrich von Hutten and Franz Sickingen offered Luther their arms for a military defense of his movement for reform, which they hoped to turn into a movement of German nationalism. Luther, for his part, refused these and other endorsements of violence declaring again and again that God alone would bring about a reformation of his church, and he would do so only through the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. In short, the significance of Martin Luther's stand at the Diet of Worms was that Luther's confession of his faith became a reform movement that would change Christianity, despite condemnation by the authorities of both church and emperor. Martin Luther would begin leading this reformation while in exile, the most important fruit of which was the reformer's translation of the New Testament into German, the language of the people. Luther's many followers would take up his bold confession of God's word and make it their own, so that one of the rallying cries of the reformation became God's word and Luther's doctrine. The princes who supported Luther's reformation in defiance of the laws of the empire, as well as the laws of the church, would within a decade wear as a badge of honor on their shoulders and later on their battle standards the motto, the word of God endures forever. Those outcomes of Luther's stand at the Diet of Worms continue today as Lutherans throughout the world continue to confess and proclaim God's word, the law, but especially the gospel. We today of Lutheran Church Canada continue to stand firm in the faith as we proclaim the freedom of every Christian to confess Jesus Christ as Lord to the glory of God the Father. Our consciences captive to the word of God in defiance to every human tradition and authority that distorts or obscures the gospel. Just as Luther's conscience was captive to God's word at Worms and throughout his lifetime. Those authorities and human traditions, both in the church and in our society, they may look different than they did to Martin Luther as he stood before empire and church to make his faithful stand at the diet of Worms. Today, the Roman Catholic Church, through its papacy and bishops and traditions, seems like more of an ally than an opponent, as Christians in Canada and throughout the world are increasingly marginalized and oppressed by worldviews and even by civil governments that are hostile to God and to God's law, as well as to the gospel of life and victory over death through the risen Lord Jesus Christ. But our present and our future as heirs to Luther's Reformation and therefore to the pure and treasured gospel of Jesus Christ will not be secured through the ecumenical compromises so prevalent in our age, nor will we stand firm through some kind of restoration of Christendom, that is a society where one visible form of the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church gains powerful influence in a society and its laws. Our present and future as heirs to Luther's Reformation, our existence and flourishing as, Lutheran, as the Lutheran Church is secured only by standing firm in our faith as Luther did, looking to God 
and believing his promise that the gates of hell itself will not prevail against the assembly of believers who hold the keys to the kingdom of heaven. The only question before us today is the question of faith. As Jesus ended his parable about the widow who persistently demanded justice from an unjust judge, Jesus said, will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? I close by inviting you to sing with me a prayer Martin Luther composed as a hymn late in his life, some 20 years after his famous stand at the Diet of Worms. This was yet again a time when the Reformation seemed doomed to fall to the tyranny of the papal church and the sword of the empire. But God answered that prayer in Luther's day, despite the odds, despite the powers of the papal church and empire that were yet again threatening to crush the Lutheran churches that had emerged as the fruit of Luther's reformation. Through this hymn that hopefully you know and love, let us stand firm in the faith and pray with God's servant Martin Luther, Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. Keep us steadfast in your word.